So what do we do? Because it is all about fossil fuels. We grow our food in petrochemical fertilizers and pesticides for the most part. Uh, all of the construction materials of our civilization are based on the carbon deposits of the Jurassic Age, from cement to plastic. Almost all of our pharmaceutical products are fossil fuel based. Most of the fiber for our clothes and materials are fossil fuel based. Our power, transport, heat, light, logistics, supply chain, it's all built off the burial grounds, the carbon deposits of the Jurassic Age. And now in this sunset, this twilight period, we have three crises. They are feeding off each other. They put us in the middle of a perfect storm. And the great cities of the world are here this afternoon to try to figure out how to get through the eye of the storm to calm waters quickly. Crisis number one, the global economic meltdown. Crisis number two, the global energy crisis. Crisis number three, the real-time impacts of climate change on agriculture already in 2009. That's the storm. Crisis one, let me say I disagree with my colleagues, many of them. They, this is not simply an economic crisis, this meltdown, or a financial crisis, or a credit crisis, or simply a crisis of the deregulation of the market. That's the echo. The earthquake is something different. And unless we understand the, the difference between the earthquake and the echo, we can't get to a post-carbon era. Here's the earthquake. The second industrial revolution based on centralized electrification, oil, the introduction of the internal combustion engine, the auto culture, the great interstate highway infrastructures, suburban rollout and construction, travel and tourism, that massive juggernaut which came together between 1900 and 1929 as a juvenile infrastructure. Then we had a depression and war, and then the mature infrastructure with the interstate, suburban rollout, tourism, it all matured between the 1950s and it peaked in the 1980s in my country, 1988. It peaked in Europe 10 years later. And in 1988, after we overbuilt the suburban rollout from the auto age, we went into a big recession. Some of you older folks remember, a housing and retail commercial recession. How did we get out of that recession in 91? Because that is the key to understanding the economic meltdown today. We didn't have a third industrial revolution in place in 91 to take up the tremendous multiplier effect of the auto age and suburban rollout. So in lieu of a third industrial revolution, and I should say the ICT revolution was boutique. It hadn't found its gate. It's only doing this right now, as we'll talk about later. So in lieu of a third industrial revolution, how did we regrow the economy? We began to live off the savings of 50 years of the second industrial revolution from 1950 to 1988. We built globalization on American purchasing power, and American purchasing power was built on the savings of the productivity and technology of an industrial revolution that had peaked in the late 80s. So we extended a, a credit card debt so we could move the economy. We began to deplete family savings, so we had purchasing power, and we began to grow globalization. It was all built on a past revolution, not on new technology and productivity. After we maxed out our credit cards, because wages had been stagnant since the auto age peaked in the 80s, then we went to bizarre mortgage instruments with our homes, but it wasn't based on new prosperity. It was based on eating up old savings and going into debt. Then that collapsed. The average family savings rate in my country in 1991 was 9%. For the last three years, it was negative, and we have a new term called negative income, which is an oxymoron. We make, spend more than we make. How bad is it? President Obama's bailout program is $2 trillion. Would you like to know what the total accumulated household debt in the United States is this afternoon? You ready? Four trillion dollars. We're broke. Unemployment's 10.2 percent, but even the U.S. Labor Department acknowledges that if you add the marginally attached workers who are only working a couple hours a week now, and then everyone else who gave up looking for work and is not counted, we have 18.2 percent unemployment. 14 trillion dollars in debt. Does anyone think we're going to come back soon? One year, two years, five years, ten years? We are living in an 
second industrial revolution that's old and senescent. The technologies, the infrastructure from the internal combustion engine to an old servo mechanical electrical grid to an old suburban rollout, it's all on life support based on energies that are sunsetting. How do we regrow the economy in any way and a dead corpse? Look around Rotterdam and Amsterdam and New York, and I was just in Athens. You can smell this is not new. And don't kid yourself. Go to China and you see the new buildings. That's still the old infrastructure and the old architecture and the old technology by and large. So number one, we have an economic meltdown. It's based on an energy regime that's sunsetting and all the technology and infrastructure built from it are on life support. Number two, the second assumption of globalization, cheap energy. We can move our capital to cheap labor markets in Asia, let them make the food, let them make the finished goods, then ship it back because energy is cheap. It's a commodity. Then a curious thing happened. When oil went over 80 a barrel, and keep that number in mind, every day you open up the paper and look to see where oil is. It's now back at 80. That's the key. When oil goes over 80 a barrel, inflation starts to rear up across the entire supply chain and logistics of the planet because everything's made from fossil fuels or moved by fossil fuels. When oil hit $147 a barrel in July of 2008, that was the earthquake. The entire economic engine of globalization turned off. Remember, purchasing power plummeted. Inflation was too high. There were food riots in 30 countries. You couldn't even afford gasoline. And the purchasing power plummeted. The economic engine turned off. That's what I call peak globalization. We now know the outer wall of what we can do based on fossil fuels and the technologies built from them. The echo was 60 days later when the financial and credit market could no longer maintain the pretense of living off an old industrial revolution. And I have to tell you that heads of state, including the ones I advise, have not yet gotten this. A few have, but not in Washington. Not in Washington. The reason we hit peak globalization at $147 a barrel is because of peak oil per capita. Do not confuse this with peak oil production. They're two different things. I know you all know about peak oil production. That's when half the world's oil reserves are used up on the classic Hubert bell curve in geology. When half the oil is used up, it's over because once you go on the other side of that bell curve, you can't afford the price. When do we have global peak oil production? There's a controversy, but it's narrowing every year. Back in 2000, the IEA, they were always the optimists until recently, International Energy Agency said at a 2% growth rate in consumption of oil, this was conservative because China and India weren't in the game yet, we peak around 2035. But in the last eight or nine years, the great geologists in the world, using new computer simulation studies, they're looking at the gas and oil reserve figures again, they're factoring in dramatic new oil discoveries that we don't even know about, South Africa, West Africa, South America, the Arctic. They're even factoring in 90% efficiency in getting the remaining oil and gas out, pretty optimistic. And they're saying by their studies, we're going to peak between 2010 and 2020. Simmons, you know, the Aramco former consultant said, we peaked last year. As you know, up here in this part of the world, the North Sea's peaked already. Mexico peaks next year. Russia peaks shortly thereafter, so their geopolitical moment for oil and gas is short-lived. I don't know who's right. It's interesting that the IEA is now have a new forecast out saying supply crunch 2014. I don't know who's right, the pessimists, the optimists. It really doesn't make any difference anymore, does it? They're arguing now about 10 or 15 or 20 years. Do we peak between 2010 and 2010 and 20, the pessimists? 2020, maybe 2030, the optimists? short time to rethink the entire energy of civilization, all the materials based on it, and create a new economy. And by the way, as you know, there's plenty of other fossil fuels. Tar sands in Canada, heavy oil in Venezuela, shale, but they're dirtier, they emit more CO2, and we never factored them in to our climate change models. <laughs>